So at time of speaking, uh, Black Mirror's sixth season has been and gone, and though it debuted at the top of the streaming charts, the hype died out pretty quickly when everyone remembered that Black Mirror is no longer necessary, no longer prescient, and not even all that interesting. Because it turns out that in-jokes and retreads of well-worn themes do not a good TV show make. But it's been nine months and at this point we've had all of the hot takes, the recaps and reaction videos, all of the reviews, so it's unlikely that anybody really cares about Black Mirror right now, except me. I care. For some reason. So I figure it's time for a retrospective, and by that I mean a full retrospective. Not just talking about season six, yes we are going all the way back to season one and the national anthem because it turns out that I have quite a lot that I want to say about Black Mirror. Will you please welcome Charlie Brooker and Annabelle Jones? Charlie Brooker is best known today as the creator, head writer and executive producer of Black Mirror and as such he's become something of a household name. He's also something of an anomaly given that most TV showrunners and producers don't achieve the level of celebrity and fame that Brooker has. Now it's not just that Black Mirror is one of the most influential TV shows in the world, it's because it crossed the digital Rubicon entering daily life as a pop cultural touchstone for real life technology. Even if you don't watch the show, the phrase it's a bit Black Mirror still conjures images of far-fetched dystopian technology becoming realised in the modern world. Congratulations, huge success. Thank you. For Black Mirror and also the fact that it has now entered the vocabulary. People say, oh, this is a little bit Black Mirror. Yeah, they do, don't they? And tonight, I'm out here on the streets asking people, are we living in a real episode of Black Mirror? Black Mirror is known for its eerie and unsettling stories, but what makes them so eerie and unsettling is the fact that they are very plausible. Welcome back, Most Amazing Fam. I'm your host, Rachel Fisher, and today we are counting down our list of top 10 terrifying predictions from Black Mirror that are slowly coming true. As creator, executive producer and head writer, Bruca has gained a reputation as something of an oracle, some kind of seer who can predict the future with unnerving accuracy. And spoilers, he is not. And Black Mirror doesn't have a steady cast of actors to act, as it were, as a focus point, so it's no surprise that Bruca himself has de facto become the face of Black Mirror. But back in 2011, before Black Mirror first aired, nobody, not even Brooker himself, could have predicted that this would happen. Back then he was just a TV presenter who'd cut his teeth as a writer on satirical British TV shows like The Eleven O'Clock Show, Brass Eye and Nathan Barley. The Rise of the Idiots by Dan Ashcroft. Once, the idiots were just the fools gawping in through the windows. Now they've entered the building. You can hear them everywhere. Yeah. They use the word cool. It is their favourite word. The idiot doesn't think about what it is saying. Thinking is rubbish, and rubbish isn't cool. But he really made his name with the Wipe series. So encompassing Screen Wipe, News Wipe, Games Wipe and Weekly Wipe, it featured Brooker as this kind of buffoonish, obnoxious and cynical TV presenter. Basically a heightened version of himself who reported on current affairs, TV and advertising and video games and for some reason slapped people a lot. It's more to further the cause of mankind. Go on, admit it. You'd love to be busy mates with them, wouldn't you? Hey, wouldn't you? Hey! 
So, which kind of presenter am I going to be? Well, hopefully an all-new one, the incompetent, obnoxious misanthrope. Or the bloated smart-ass, depending on how you look at it. But despite his on-screen persona and his pre-2011 output, it does kind of track that Black Mirror is where Bruker would end up. In many ways, he has always been heading towards Black Mirror. Hindsight here is, of course, everything, but that cutting satirical edge of the National Anthem has always been there, has always been present in Bruker's work. But it's still shocking to see just how big the thing became. Because at heart, Brooker is a cult British TV figure, clearly uneasy with his fame. And what makes Black Mirror compelling is that it is at heart a cult British TV satire, which aired on Channel 4, but which has been taken and filtered through a major multinational streaming service, leaving it utterly compromised and basically unrecognisable in effect, a parody of itself. So seeing that process of a show going from cult British TV to mainstream global phenomenon is very instructive and incredibly revealing because you get to see the diametric impulses of the two channels in action. Channel 4 is a publicly owned British TV channel, despite the best efforts of former culture secretary Nadine Dorries, Late last night, the Culture Secretary Nadine Dorries announced she was putting Channel 4 up for sale. But the current Culture Secretary, Michelle Donnellan, has made her position clear. After reviewing the business case, I've concluded that pursuing a sale at this point is not the right decision. It doesn't produce its own programmes, but commissions them, and it has a special remit to cater for minority interests and to pursue creative original shows. Netflix, if it needs be said, is a video on demand streaming service available basically worldwide with roughly 260 million subscribers as of 2023. One of these things is not like the other, despite Nanny Dory's best efforts. So once it moved channels, Black Mirror was always going to change, no matter how much Brooker and his team insist that Netflix doesn't interfere, that it leaves them to their own devices to do whatever they want. I don't know, I think, I think you wish that they had pushed back a little more. They agreed really quickly. It would have been great to sort of appear like real rebels and sort of... <laughs> they didn't want us to do it, we did it anyway, because we're so cool. But um, that's not what happened, though. We asked them and they went, yeah, that sounds great. They have a real sense of humour. Yeah. Real sense of humour. <laughs> Methinks the lady doth protest a little too much, because Netflix by design was going to have a compromising effect on Black Mirror. It's not just the massively inflated budgets and global exposure, though those are factors. It's because a Netflix show which doesn't have massive mainstream appeal, just it's just not going to last as long as Black Mirror has. So early Black Mirror's relationship to its audience is often confrontational. It interrogates viewers. It reflects viewers' worst behaviours, their innate values and beliefs, hence the mirror part of Black Mirror. And as we're going to see, that's just not going to fly on Netflix. Netflix doesn't want to make its viewers uncomfortable, which means that any short commissions is going to fall in line by default, or it's going to be cancelled. In other words, Netflix doesn't have to say the quiet part out loud. So with this retrospective, I want to really focus on how and why Black Mirror changed across time, particularly as it moved from Channel 4 to Netflix. And I want to focus on how those changes have left Black Mirror a compromised, confused mess, which thinks itself to be far, far smarter than it actually is. And I want to really get across the sense of profound disappointment in seeing a show which brought us the national anthem devolve into the trite moralising of Nosedive, in seeing it become almost totally obsessed with boomer concerns about society and technology and, yes, the youth, before falling entirely into self-importance and self-parody. And I want to talk about the ironies of a show which uses technology to talk about human behaviour, becoming itself more and more reliant on technology to the point at which set designers are creating virtual reality versions of the San Junipero bar.
Before we built Tucker's Bar for real, we built it in 3D. I gave Charlie and Owen a VR headset so they could walk around the bar and look at the space. In the industry, that process is just beginning, so we marched ahead a bit. We were Black Mirror after all. You could walk around this VR bar and say things like, can we push the bar back a bit? Can we make the balcony a bit wider? Absolutely no sense of irony. It is, it's staggering. At the same time, I don't want to make this a channel for good Netflix bad dichotomy, which admittedly is what I set out to make. One of the reasons why this is going to be a series is because it turns out that things are much more complicated. Now, while I personally think that Black Mirror's Channel 4 run is one of the most powerful and thought-provoking TV runs I've ever seen, we're going to put a big asterisk against that because the more you watch it, the more you see the warning signs. There are problems with Black Mirror's early run which suggest that maybe Black Mirror was always going to become what it has become. That in some ways it has always been what it is now. So with that in mind, let's go back to the very beginning. Black Mirror begins in December 2011 with the National Anthem. You remember the National Anthem as the episode in which British Prime Minister Michael Callow has sex with a pig on live television. Or at least that's what we all remember. But it's not actually what the episode is about. For example, you've probably forgotten that the episode is about the abduction of fictional British Princess Susanna and that the Prime Minister has sex with a pig because that is the kidnapper's single demand. You've probably forgotten that Princess Susanna is released before the broadcast and that the kidnapper is an award-winning artist making a statement who hangs himself out of disgust at the behaviour of the media and the public. And if you haven't forgotten all of this, you probably don't really care because Four years after the episode aired, an unofficial biography revealed that then Prime Minister of the UK, David Cameron, once put his penis inside a pig's head during a student initiation. So this is all anyone ever talks about in relation to the national anthem. Heady tales of drug use and poor sign hijinks. Now that you've forgotten all of this except the pig sex kind of proves the episode's point and it's why the national anthem works so well as satire. It uses the kind of the cadence and rhythms of a fictional media scandal to reflect the cadence and rhythms of real media scandals, in effect showing how the media and the public combine and collaborate to turn public events into public entertainment. So a media blackout is broken as journalists and editors scrabble about trying to get exclusives, Footage of the kidnapped princess is sent to fictional news channel UKN and it's released on air even though the producers know it's going to make the situation worse. A journalist sends a government staff member explicit selfies to get exclusive information, including the location of a police raid, and when the raid goes wrong that journalist is shot and injured. And the whole thing goes viral on Twitter where, ironically, people make much the same jokes that real Twitter users would later make during the David Cameron scandal. Hashtag Piggate. A plan to superimpose the Prime Minister's face onto a porn star's body is ridiculous. It's also ruined when a member of the public takes a picture of the porn star. And crowds gather around TVs to watch the news and to speculate. All of this coming together to turn the whole thing into a media spectacle, a joke, a bit of a laugh. You know, the sort of car crash TV which dehumanises the people involved and desensitizes audiences to the consequences. In a few minutes, the Prime Minister will perform an indecent act on your screen. This is an important In the midst of this, everybody loses sight of the real issue that, you know, a young woman's life is supposed to be in danger. So, as the deadline gets closer and closer, more and more of the focus is put on the will he, won't he, until the cat jumps off the settee and makes a noise. And so, in the midst of all of this, Everybody loses sight of the real issue. 
you know, that a young woman's life is supposed to be in danger. So as the deadline gets closer, more and more focus is put on the will he, won't he, until it consumes and becomes the full story. And then we find out that the princess had actually been released 30 minutes before the broadcast. Why? My guess, he knew everyone would be elsewhere, watching screens. So it's a statement. Which, frankly, paints a damning picture of, well, pretty much everyone. The very pivotal moment was with the on-screen people in the pub watching the live broadcast. It suddenly becomes very clear that actually humanity, society and media and all of us are responsible for this. So the National Anthem is not the episode about the Prime Minister f***ing a pig, but thinking of it that way is to fall into the episode's trap. And that's what I think makes this episode one of the best pieces of satire I've ever seen, because it doesn't just implicate the media and the public, it implicates the viewer. The viewer's journey mirrors the audience's journey in the episode. The viewer loses sight of the real story, gets caught up in the speculation. The viewer sits and wonders if Black Mirror is really going to make the Prime Minister f a pig, as if that's the point. You feel culpable for what's happened to Callow. You kind of go, oh shit, this is awful. Look what I've done. We all buy the papers and get on the Twitter feeds. And in that sense, the National Anthem is still a pretty powerful piece of television. I mean, it made media figures at the press screening feel very uncomfortable. And frankly, that is the correct way to make media figures feel. The first time we did a show in for it was we, we showed it to the press um, a couple of weeks before it came out. Uh, and there was sort of, there was quite a lot of people, there was about sort of 60, 70 press there or something. And um, there was a really, really brilliant moment, you know, um, th you know, they, you know, they were laughing, they were kind of smirking, they were kind of gasping and, and this kind of stuff. And they were very, you know, very engaged with it and giggling with it. And then there's the moment in the pub where everybody could cheers, go, eh, PM's going to do something, an indecent act with a pig. And they'll go, eh. and then suddenly when it started, it was amazing. I mean, as, as the faces in the pub all just kind of dropped and were shocked. So the whole order, the energy in the whole auditorium just changed exactly at that moment. And, and, and everybody just sort of stopped being press and stopped being, you know, taking notes and stopped giggling at it. And, 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 you know, and, and it was really cool. It was, it was at that moment that they really felt their responsibility in it. And, and, and they really, you know, they was like, oh my God wow, this is, this is basically about us. They went from incredulity to amusement to disgust and sadness. You're meant to be left with sadness at the end of that. It's sad and pathetic and everyone is cheapened by it. Fifteen Million Merits is a spiritual companion to the National Anthem, though that might not be obvious at first because it takes us via whiplash to a dystopian future in which the working classes are forced to pedal stationary bicycles for merits. Those merits are then used to buy essentials like food and toothpaste, but also forms of entertainment which distract everyone from the fact that they are trapped in an endless cycle, pun not intended, though metaphor definitely intended. There is only really one way to escape from this purgatory, and that's limited and exclusive because it costs 15 million merits. That's the entry fee to Hotshot, the reality TV show which promises successful candidates fame, fortune and freedom. So though there is an extended satire of capitalism, the episode's real target is reality television. That was beyond incredible! So this is what makes 15 Million Merits and the National Anthem companion pieces, because they both speak to the neglect of the media, of dehumanisation, of what happens to people who are put in the public eye for entertainment, and they both speak of the public's complicity in those events. You make the call on Hotshot! So as in the National Anthem, 15 Million Merits implicates the viewer by reflecting the viewer's own behaviour as part of an audience. And this isn't just an abstraction. In effect, what 15 Million Merits says is that this is the viewer. The viewer is not Bing, they're not Abby. 
the viewer is the hotshot audience, being shown what they are really like. And this is, in effect, how audiences watch reality TV shows like Britain's Got Talent or The Voice. The viewer doesn't actually care about the people on stage because those people have volunteered themselves, have put themselves up for judgment and are therefore fair game. They should know what to expect. You want to come up here and sing, Simon? Because I'd like to see you face that lot. <laughs> they are there for the audience's entertainment and they're discarded as soon as the show is over. I mean, does anybody still care about the novelty career of 2023 Britain's Got Talent winner Vigo Venn? So by showing Bing and Abby as human beings with very real human impulses, not there on stage seeking fame or volunteering for judgment, but looking for their only chance of freedom or their only chance of protest, 15 Million Merits lays bare the hypocrisy. It reveals how contestants are reduced to characters in a narrative, their own desires reduced to wanting nothing more than to be famous, the circumstances of their lives rendered unimportant and non-existent. Abby wants to be a singer because she can sing and because it is literally her only chance to escape the bike, but she's cajoled by the judges and the audience into becoming a porn star because it's made clear that that's her only way out and it makes a pretty good narrative. Bing is also folded into the narrative. His anger and passion is taken and neutralised and commodified and the audience is cheering him on as he willingly sells out because... He's the bike. Certainly does. Incidentally, keep all of this in mind because once we get to later seasons, some of this is going to become a painfully appropriate metaphor for Black Mirror itself. I'd like to hear you talk again. How so? The slot on one of my streams where you can talk just like that. The entire history of you is about jealousy, obsession, guilt, insecurity and abuse. It is about Liam, who lives in a world in which all of your memories are recorded and stored in a digital implant called a grain. This is in effect a heightened metaphor for email, text messages, messenger services, social media, mobile phones, basically any form of digital media which keeps a record of things like conversations, pictures and videos. So as a metaphor, the grain is a way into talking about jealousy and obsession because Liam is already naturally jealous and obsessive, which makes the grain an enabler. It enables behaviours Liam otherwise wouldn't be able to indulge in the same way that, say, a mobile phone can enable somebody so inclined to look at their partner's text messages. At the beginning of the episode, Liam is obsessively replaying the details of a performance review, scrubbing those details of meaning and context by fixating on the meaning of a single moment until all that remains is what Liam is already inclined to believe. It is this obsessive need to fixate on contextless details which comes out of a desire, almost a need, to find something you already suspect or already believe. If you put yourself, if you put yourself in the shoes of somebody with a crush on somebody in the, in ye olden days, you'd have just been having conversations or sharing glances, and then you'd have gone home and thought, oh, do they fancy me? I mean, they smiled at me when I said that thing, and they, oh, I don't, and they said that thing. Whereas now, um, you can overanalyze. I've heard people going, oh, they put a smiley face at the end of this uh, tweet. What? What does that mean? I mean, do they, is that a good thing? Is that, you can overanalyze everything. It's constantly stored in aspic. Every moment is frozen. Liam becomes suspicious of his wife, Fionn, when he sees her talking to another man, Jonas, at a dinner party. He begins to replay Fionn's interactions with and reactions to Jonas. Easy. <laughs> Lift read reconstruction enabled. No, I'm a serial monogamist. I'm staying faithful to my cornflakes right now. 
<laughs> grills her on their relationship to the point of becoming abusive and starts drinking through the day. You speak to that Jonas much? No, no, not really. Is he a big part of the gang? Who? Jonas. But you dated him for a month. That's what I said. Because when you told me about Mr Marrakesh, it was a week. I was just wondering because you found it funny, but it clearly isn't, and Gina agrees. I don't really want to get involved. Is that Marrakesh? Does that look like Marrakesh? For the record, this is the morning after the dinner party. Liam's behaviour spirals when he finds out that Fiona and Jonas's past relationship was more involved than she first admitted. Liam gets drunk, confronts and assaults Jonas and forces him to delete all his memories of Fionn. <laughs> now delete it all. The lot! Then he drunk drives into a tree. Good job, Liam. Replaying the events, Liam sees an image of Fionn with Jonas, which seems to prove what he suspected. He confronts Fionn and she admits that, yes, she cheated on Liam with Jonas, but adds the pretty important caveat that this was at the time when Liam's jealous tendencies were already out of control and he had disappeared for five days without calling or leaving a message. For five days, Liam. No call, no nothing. Sometime later, Liam is replaying happier memories of Fionn, memories which in his obsession he had forgotten or lost sight of, which proved that Fionn really did love him. Flashing between these memories and the present, we see that Fionn has left with their child and that Liam is alone and lonely and miserable, having destroyed his own relationship. Standing in front of the mirror, he decides to cut out the grain with a razor. The entire history of you is something of a departure from the season's other episodes because it's the only episode which isn't about collective systemic behavior. It's actually about people as individuals. And this might make it slightly harder to pass at first. If the National Anthem and 15 Million Merits interrogate the viewer's behavior as part of a collective, then what does the entire history of you interrogate? So it doesn't reflect the viewer's behaviour, unless you are, of course, insanely jealous and insanely obsessive. It instead asks the viewer to consider their own values. At heart, it asks a single question. Do the ends justify the means? In other words, do you think that Liam was correct, that he was justified? So Liam is naturally obsessive, controlling, overly pessimistic, insecure. Ultimately, he becomes abusive and dangerous. But Fionn did technically cheat. Liam was technically correct. Now, from the context, it seems pretty clear where the episode stands. Liam did this to himself. His behaviour, his jealousy, inability to let go of the past, his fixation on petty details, all of this pushes Fionn away, in some ways push her to cheat. I mean, the dude disappeared for five days because he was jealous. Liam's an obviously obsessive guy from the beginning, driving Fionn away. They had a break. We were on a break! <laughs> during which she has a different relationship. The story is about someone whose natural tendencies are enabled by a piece of tech. So I think Liam already had that jealousy in him, but in a reductive way, it's a cautionary tale about someone getting tech that allows the latent bad parts of their character to come out. Uh, in the third episode, um, Liam has two problems really. He's over analytical and he can't, can't let the past be the past. And there are two problems which are he would have had anyway, but because he's clearly quite insecure and jealous. Um, but the technology is definitely letting him really pick and pick at that scab. You know, if you imagine a world before that technology exists, then what Fionn does with Jonas 18 months ago would have been she's ashamed of it, but it would have it, she would have regretted it and moved on, and it would have been in the past and and he would still have his marriage and, you know, and his kid and you know, everything. But the entire history of you's conclusion, as presented in the episode, isn't explicit. Ultimately, it leaves the viewer to decide if they think Liam was right or not. And this is where we start to get into trouble. Okay, so to explain this, let's talk briefly about plot twists. A 
plot twist is a device which recontextualizes a work of fiction. It usually comes at or near the end, and it's generally understood to be the moment at which the truth of the thing is revealed. It's, he was dead all along. I see people. They don't know they're dead. It's Silent, Silent Green, Green is people. people. It's finding out that Rosebud was his childhood sled. Spoilers. There are several types and variations of plot twist, some of which overlap, uh, but this is typically the most common. So it's the lens through which viewers are likely to see the entire history of you. And as a result, you'd kind of be understood if you see the episode's revelation that Theon did sleep with Jonas as the truth. In effect, seeing the plot twist as the episode's justification for Liam's behavior. The ends do indeed justify the means because Liam was right all along. And extrapolating further, you might conclude that the child is not Liam's and therefore that Fiona is inherently duplicitous and irredeemable and actually Liam is the victim. But clearly none of that is intended. As in the National Anthem, the entire History of You's plot twist has a different intent. It does indeed recontextualize the episode, but it's not in service of revealing the truth. It's to interrogate the viewer. In the National Anthem, Princess Susanna's release, remember, is not a gotcha. It's a reminder that you'd forgotten about her. The entire History of You shows you Liam's jealousy, his obsession, his abusive behavior, leads you to think that he might be making the whole thing up. And then it asks you what you think when you find out he was technically correct. And I don't believe that I have to say this, but if your conclusion, your belief is that Liam was correct, that his behavior was justified by the outcome, then you're ignoring a lot of context. This isn't me! Look at what you're doing to me! I might have some questions for you. So in a way, this makes the entire history of you a failure of intent, sort of, in part. I mean, I watched a lot of reaction videos to the episode thinking that I'd find far too many people who basically and uncritically accept the plot twist as justification for Liam's behavior. And many people do. And you're only sorry because you got caught. Knew it. Knew it! Yo! Show me on that. Jesus. God bless him. <laughs> but it's also heartening to see that a lot of those people seem to revise their opinions once they go back and reconsider the episode. Like the moment he witnessed that little interaction with him, with his wife, and Jonas. and Jonas, like, he immediately became crazy about it. It's like, oh my God, what happened there? He rewound it, he zoomed in, he got, like, analyzed what was being said. Yes. And then, you know, I mean, the fact that he can, like, you know, make somebody else, show me what happened. Yeah. That's ter- I just, I mean, that's a lot. I guess at that point, he's probably just desperate to, like, yeah. he didn't care, he ruined his whole- But it wasn't his fault, like, I mean- he chose, he, he could, he could have chose what he, um, his actions, like, he could have went right. about it differently. But it's also like, it's just like getting stuck. Like, you can't move on from things if you keep rewinding it. Like, we can't rewind anything. So, like, yeah. we eventually move on, but, like, with this, like, you yeah, can't even... Yeah, but the thing is, you, he could have deleted it, but he yeah, chose to not... Yeah, of course, you choose not to. Not to like, maybe, have... Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is fascinating, this is really fascinating. We're literally living in the past, not... Not in the present. Yeah. And technically, I get that he was upset that she slept with the guy within a few days, you know, of them uh, breaking up, but or like him leaving or whatever. But I mean, they just use the word bro broken up. But if he was gone for five days, then you weren't together. And I can definitely be frustrated and like and upset with uh, the person I'm with if within five days, you know, they go and sleep with somebody. But five days no call no text no nothing you you're not allowed to put a time frame on somebody 
but at the same time. I don't know if anyone said this, but Liam is right in the entire history of you. Yes, he goes crazy and goes off on a tangent, but I fully believe he was correct in trying to persecute this obvious infidelity amongst Fee and Jonas. He absolutely went a little far with the physicality, but man, if that was my wife, I'd also be His gut feeling was completely correct, and he didn't need the tech to know something was very wrong. Especially how awkward things were between Jonas and his wife, forgot her name, and the subtle glances and stopped short conversations between them when Liam would get within earshot. Also him slowly uncovering how her relationship with Jonas was much more than just a weekend fling like she kept on lying about. First it was like two days, then it was a week, then it was two weeks. All the tech did was prove him right. Every time I watch it, I hate fear a little more. And sooner or later, Jonas was going to get what was coming to him anyway. It may as well have been Liam that did it. Even worse was how they were going to cheat with each other again that night, because Liam wasn't supposed to be home till later the following evening. This had obviously been going on a long time, and she cheated on Liam with Jonas God knows how many times, or even with God knows how many other guys. Then there was the daughter. Damn, that was messed up. My favourite episode by far, Liam was right. I mean, I genuinely do not know how you can watch this. Show it to me! Show it to me! I want to see, I want to see what he looks like! And not understand it to be abuser behaviour. But if you're going to leave space for personal interpretation, you're going to get personal interpretation. So I want to finish this video by talking briefly about a couple of issues that will become much more overt in season two. And the first is how Black Mirror portrays the public. So we're talking about the crowds in the hospital and the pub. We're talking about the reality TV audience. And we're talking about how Black Mirror sees the public as in unthinking, gullible mass, barely more cognizant than animals, cruel and capricious. In a few minutes, the Prime Minister will perform an indecent act on your screen. This is an accordance with... The terrorists will take her head off. Oi, oi, Rod. Oi, oi, Gemini. And it's all just, it's just crass and cynical and lazy. The Rise of the Idiots by Dan Ashcroft. Once the idiots were just the fools gawping in through the windows. Now they've entered the building. You can hear them everywhere. Yeah. They use the word cool. It is their favorite word. The idiot doesn't think about what it is saying. Thinking is rubbish, and rubbish isn't cool. And it has some problematic class undertones. For example, in the National Anthem, Black Mirror has no interest in why the public might be like this, why they might want to see a conservative politician be humiliated, why they might just not care about him. But there, you know, there's moments where we went out onto the streets and, and, and asked real people about what about the situation. We filmed all of those for real. It was also pretty shocking because the level of sort of, the level of, yeah, it was, it was pretty depressing actually. The level of hate towards politicians really shocked me. And the level of kind of, and the level of sort of, the way people had sort of kind of abstained themselves of any responsibility or removed themselves from the picture and had kind of just gone, for want of a better phrase, there is a tacit unstated view that this is just what the public is like, that there's no point in trying to understand their behaviour. This is going to be an ongoing problem with Black Mirror specifically, but it's also a kind of a limit of satire and irony generally. Satire exposes problems, but it has trouble understanding the conditions which causes those problems, and it is singularly unequipped to propose solutions.
So Black Mirror puts the responsibility on the individual. In 15 Million Merits, you can see that Black Mirror has no interest understanding why reality TV audiences act the way they do. It is singularly uninterested in how reality TV is calculated to encourage behaviours, how producers create drama and distort truths to manipulate audiences, in some extreme cases distorting an audience's view of reality. It does kind of touch on those themes, but it abstracts the role and influence of producers until they are essentially removed from the equation, inadvertently making reality TV some sort of inevitable force that's just sort of created and sustained by the public's need for entertainment. Even the hotshots hosts themselves might be distasteful. Good though your voice is, and it is good. <laughs> it's not the most magical sound in the world. It's just good. No titties? She says she's here to see. <laughs> but they're not really accountable because they themselves are just characters in the narrative. And, and the characters in The X Factor are, well, the characters, they're people. Are they characters? They're characterful people. They're larger than life. Their behaviour is dictated by the whims of the audience. They, like the contestants, perform for an audience. That was, without a doubt, probably the best piece of singing we've had this season. And that this audience is comprised of working class people is kind of revealing of a very middle class view of working class entertainment and working class audiences as crass and cruel and without any merit whatsoever. So this is a pretty disappointing and cynical view of the world in which systemic change is not possible. And so its solution is to present an ugly reflection of the viewer and tell that viewer that they need to change, that they need to do better. I also want to talk very quickly again about Piggate and what it says about Black Mirrors and Charlie Brooker's reputation for predicting the future. I say that, I don't actually want to talk about Piggate, but here we are. So an unofficial biography of then British Prime Minister David Cameron was released in 2015. Titled Call Me Dave, it was a hack piece from former Deputy Chairman of the Conservative Party Michael Ashcroft and right-wing journalist Isabel Oakeshott. It was essentially the Conservative Party airing its dirty laundry in public and settling old scores, and few people outside of right-wing politics would have cared if it hadn't been serialised by the Daily Mail, and if it didn't contain an unverified allegation that Cameron once put his penis in a pig's head as part of a student initiation. It didn't take long for people to connect the story to the national anthem, so Brooker went on record to deny that he knew about the story and to confirm that the whole thing was just a bizarre coincidence. When that actually happened, I had a moment of weird vertigo. For a moment, I genuinely worried that everything in the universe is a figment of my imagination. It was such a weird coincidence and I knew no one had told me. So for a moment I thought, what if all my life is a dream? But the similarities between the two things are the first point at which Black Mirror and Bruca start to gain a reputation for predicting the future. A reputation Bruca has been only too happy to accept. Congratulations, huge success. Thank you. For Black Mirror and also the fact that it has now entered the vocabulary. People say, oh, this is a little bit Black Mirror. Yeah, they do, don't they? The strangest reaction has probably been when people think we've predicted stuff, and that's quite odd, because I find that genuinely unsettling in my bones. You seem to have predicted a lot, though. I know, it's a bit weird. I don't think... I hope that... I hope that's not true, because there's lots of other horrible things coming, which would be worse. There are a couple of things to talk about here. The first, perhaps most importantly, is to clarify that Black Mirror did not predict Piggate. It reflected the way that political scandals like Piggate were already being reported. 
as throwing your toys out of the cot goes in politics. Lord Ashcroft's critics are saying it doesn't come much more salacious or bizarre. Heady tales of drug use and poor sign hijinks. And all set to the sound of Supertramp. Does it change our view of the Prime Minister, though? So lots of things being said, Janet, all unsubstantiated at the moment, lots of people commenting about it, lots and lots of headlines, uh, quite fun. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, we just asked the guys on the gate. Are you sure it's the right address? Uh, we have a... Oh, OK. We've got delivery for our David Cameron. The worrying implication of all of this is that Brooker himself, the writer of the National Anthem, didn't seem to understand this. Brooker himself seems convinced to this day that he really did predict the future. He seems completely unaware that the prima facie details are not actually important. It doesn't matter that both of these things involved a prime minister and a pig. This is going to come up again in season two when the Waldo moment comes out and people are talking about how it predicted the rise of Donald Trump. What is this for? And why do we waste our time with animated trivialities like him? I mean, why? Why? I mean, why? I mean, why? I mean, why? I mean, why? This is just I mean, why? a kind of thing. Well, you see, you laugh. They laugh at you, Limbo. So you've got that to look forward to. So to conclude this first video, um, I'm not sure how much you can say Black Mirror's first season succeeds in its aims. It certainly does interrogate the viewer, or at least it tries. But so, so, what, yeah, as I said, what I really, really wanted to do was point the finger firmly at us, at society. But I mean, people, the way people re have reacted to it, it, yeah, it's kind of like, you know, it, they reacted to it in the same kind of way that you'd react to, you know, some really, really hardcore, you know, films like Irreversible or just, you know, these big, big Hollywood movies where you just kind of go, you know, because of what's on, but, and that's really cool when you, you know, when, when, when you get that level of reaction. I mean, I've had people, you know, a couple of people who won't talk to me, you know, but, you know, or really, really repulsed by it. And it does seem, looking at reactions to these episodes, that it did cause a lot of people to rethink their own viewing habits, to reconsider their own values and beliefs. Everybody was it's glued just, to their screens. I, I think it's a symbolism for how obsessed we are with viral Te content technology. And, and technology and all that stuff. It's like, we watch crazy things live streamed on social media and stuff and when it's a big enough event we're all just like oh my god oh my god but how that translates to a wider audience is open to debate in an interview for the season one dvd brooker makes it clear that some viewers aren't really getting the intended message aren't really engaging with the series as the creators wanted them to and instead they're engaging with pointless non sequiturs like what would have happened if the prime minister hadn't fucked the pig what if the prime minister didn't give in to the demand. That's one thing. Why was everyone watching? Would everyone literally tune in to watch that? The finger. A lot of people are a bit annoyed about the finger, the plot inconsistency. In 15 million merits, where are they living? A lot of people have wondered whether Ben is looking out over, over the, a real vista at the end of episode two, or he's, whether he's just staring at another wall of screens. Was it his baby? Well, again, this is a question for Jesse. I don't know. That Bruca, for the most part, engages honestly with these non sequiturs is a worrying sign of how he and Black Mirror's relationship to its viewers is going to rapidly change once the series gets to Netflix. And this sort of non sequitur is influencing entire episodes. The fact that Cooper ultimately dies because his mum calls his phone, that was partly a knowing nod to people who say, Oh, it's the show where some British guy warns you about what would happen if you dropped your smartphone on your toe, and then the pixels went into the toenail and filled up your bum, and your bum went digital, and then your bum was emailing your ear and you didn't know about it, and then they were talking about you behind your back. So we deliberately did an episode where a phone does kill someone. <laughs> Mm-hmm.
But that's getting ahead of ourselves. So I uh, will see you for part two of this series in which we'll look at how the themes introduced in season one are continued and involved in season two and what that all means for the future of Black Mirror.